Hello and you're welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunday Independent. This week we're going to talk about Starlink, which is the satellite broadband alternative system that some people are starting to look at, partially because Elon Musk has introduced it through one of his companies and partially because the National Broadband Plan is taking a long time to roll out to uh, parts of Ireland. So I'm joined by two people to talk about this. Rory Fitzpatrick is the CEO of the National Space Centre down in Cork. And Brian Flanagan is a Starlink customer, one of the few in Ireland. Brian, I'm going to start with you. Um, where do you live, Brian? I live in Black Rock in a semi-detached house. In Black Rock in Dublin? Dublin, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to ask you, why did you decide to get Starlink then? Presumably you're served by other types of broadband there, are you not? Yes, I have cable um, fibre to the connection at the moment from air. But so, you've, I so, you've, you've, so you've air fibre, fibre, fibre to the home to or the, air? To the cabinet. Okay, so it's phone line. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, yes. so it might be crap. Uh, no, I get speeds of 100, um, 100 uh, megabits, and the latency is about six or seven seconds. On the air phone line? Yeah, yeah. So why did you go choose to uh, uh, go and purchase Starlink then? Uh, actually, I didn't purchase it. I have a ah. loan from um, SpaceX. Okay, and so this is going to be, this is going to be a very important point. Because we're going to talk about um, whether Starlink is a good solution for people to consider mm -hmm. uh, for themselves. You have, at the moment, phone line broadband from air with 100 megabits per second. You're now testing Starlink. What speed do you get on that? Um, they typically, at the moment, I'm getting about 200. 200, okay. 200. Now, Based... I'll explain, I can explain more about how I get it later yeah. on. <laughs> Based on what you have seen from both services at the moment, 200 from SpaceX, you say 100 from Air, which one do you think you w would or will choose? Uh, leaving out the economy, the costs, etc. I ah. go for the fa faster system. Okay. How much does SpaceX, or <laughs> SpaceX, how much does Starlink? cost you per month how well, much well, would it, it cost co per month? it costs me nothing because i have the system on loan but yeah yeah but if if i was paying i would be paying 500 euro for the antenna uh up front and then 99 euro a month for the use of the service how much does the air service cost oh about 50 i suppose so you'd be paying twice as much on a monthly basis per year plus you'd be paying 500 euro up front mm -hmm. would you still go with with that service uh, no, not necessarily because i have okay. a wide choice but if yeah. if i was not in dublin in a rural area and was yeah. working off maybe 20 or 30 megabits a second i would bite a hand off to get started. sure Absolutely. I, we're we're going to get into that in a bit. Um, Rory, just first of all, what is the National Space Centre that you are CEO of? <laughs> um, we're we're a, an Irish enterprise Ireland backed private company. We took over Aircom's old um, facility to beam stuff to satellite for communication between Europe and America. Um, it became obsolete and we took it over and we're now doing satellite broadcast communication and TT and C anything up and down to satellites basically we're doing from site okay so what what in that context what's your connection or use in the chain that starlink is involved in well any any satellite owner operator has to communicate between the ground infrastructure and the fiber network and the satellites in space to get a signal to somebody's house so traditionally if you look at any satellite whether it's a, a low orbit satellite or a, or a, a geosynchronous satellite a guy gets a dish sits it in his garden, points it at the satellite, bounces the signal up to the satellite, back down to the ground station, wherever that is, and that then gets the information from the internet and sends it back to the satellite, back to his dish. So that's... Okay, so just, just again, to, as Homer Simpson would say, to dumb it down even a bit more, yeah. I have, say, a Starlink dish, yeah. and I'm, you know, on the internet. What part of that chain of data is going through your facility, if any? 
if if you were sitting someplace in West Cork or Kerry or Dublin or wherever, you your signal bounces off the Starlink satellite coming overhead. It bounces down to our facility or one of the other ground stations, the nearest ground station, but our facility would be the Irish one at the moment. It then would go from our facility into the fibre network to London, and then it gets the internet traffic from London, brings it back to the uh, Starlink uplink and beams it up to the satellite and back down to your back down to your computer okay. in, in okay. 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. In broad strokes, how does Starlink work? Because one of the uh, problems that people associate with satellite broadband as an option, if they have other choices, is that they're quite high in the sky and there's what they call a latency problem. So there can be sometimes a delay. So how does, why is Starlink different? Um, well, okay, so initially most of the satellites for internet and communication would have been uh, geosynchronous, and that means they sit 33,000 kilometers out from the equator and float as the world spins around. So anyone who has Sky TV or, uh, or a satellite TV thing, that's where that would be pointing. So for Ireland, normally you'd be pointing 28.2 east of south. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's where it would be. Now, the problem is it's 33,000 kilometers out. So it takes a long time for the signal to get out and back. And anybody who would have used the old satellite system that we're using this would have had problems with latency where if they were using web tunneling stuff or a lot of the kind of uh, Citrix, Oracle, any of the advanced uh, kind of communication stuff, it was timing out. So it would drop off and it wouldn't work properly. Um, obviously, if you were gaming, and some fella has a sniper and you're waiting like for the time going out, you're dead. There's, there's no way you're going to compete with cable. So, so that was always an issue. Um, and, and there was lots of problems with that. Um, now, what is a massive game changer here is the upping in technology where effectively the satellites are replacing your Wi-Fi network. So instead of having a load of masts, you're, you've got floating masts in the sky and the low orbit satellites are only about 600 miles up. So they're whipping around really fast. And normally you're going from the north to the south. There's actually a... By the way, that is a lot lower than they would normally be. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, there's a really interesting app. If anyone is interested in this at all, it's called celestrack.com. C-E-L-E-S-T-R-A-K.com. And if they download that app, they can see the Starlink network live. And they can mm. see the satellites as they're as they're floating. But you know what? They may not even have to download that app soon because if Starlink and SpaceX and all and Amazon and all of the other companies that are saying they're going to launch satellites into space, if they do so on the schedule that they're talking about, you won't need an app to see them. Um, yep. You you'll you look up and what you think are floating stars or points of light. The sky's the sky's going to be pretty crowded with these things, aren't they? They are. In the beginning, they were more noticeable. And um, so, it, like, if you look at this, this has only really started in the last year, and this has accelerated really. The one thing Elon Musk is good at doing is doing things quickly. Like it, it is. Well, so how ma how many satellites do start? It's about fifteen hundred at the moment. They've. 16 1620 or something up to date, yeah. right so and, and they're they're launching them in 60s in fact if you look at the launch patterns you can see them lined up like a long cylindrical list mm. in space and then they slowly spread out into their network and right. they kind of come up as far as the middle of ireland so 52 degrees is about the most northerly point and then they go, so they, they fly in, in a kind of a up to 52, back down to 52 and up to 52. That's where they are. So I've seen, I've seen two criticisms of that. One is from the astronomers because yeah. they're saying you're going to pollute our beautiful skies. We're not mm -hmm. going to be able to see anything uh, anymore. And the second one, which is a little bit more of a security and a health issue is this potential danger of satellites colliding because if all of the satellites that are said to be launched do actually launch from all the different countries you're going to need an awful lot of data sharing between those different companies organizations institutions sometimes governments mm. and i'm reading testimony from professors and scientists who say they don't see that cooperation at the moment no and, and it, it will probably like if you look historically the way this happens you get the same thing with the automobile and any technology advance you'll have people screaming that it'll end the world and you have people on the other side saying that it has to happen it doesn't matter so, mm. and there's a fight between the two now I'm sure there will be some big problem with a satellite hitting something or taking down an aircraft or some, there will be some big problem. And then the insurance companies will get involved and the industry will be forced to change. 
And, and that's normally the way it will come. But if you look at the numbers, like SpaceX is, as I said, just the first, the first out of the blocks. Um, and just to put it in context, we've been up and operational for 10 years now, this year. And when we started, there was a total number of satellites in space of somewhere around 6,000. Mm. Now, half of those are spy satellites and half of them were commercial satellites. That, half of them are spy satellites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's and that's Do we know do we know how many of them are attributed to which country? America owns most. Like America is wow. the major satellite operator. Canada does a bit as well, but they would be the biggest player in the What the Canadians are spying on us. The Canadians have a lot of satellites up. They they would have had a lot of stuff over ice flow and like they they have a huge tract of land. It's very remote. Satellite really delivers a lot for them. Um and and then you look, you look at all the different um, plans that are coming down the line. So Musk, uh, Elon Musk has announced he's going to do 12,000. That's for his network. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got about four other American major companies racing to get in there. Apple are talking about it. They, you know, there's, there's a lot of American companies that have access to money that are looking to do it. And then we have the Russians, the Chinese, the Koreans, the Indians, like all these different countries and Europe. Um, Europe now is doing so, a one web purchase where mm. Utelsat are going to operate the one web network for broadband. So, so suddenly, Bri 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 I yeah, just to take, take Brian in there. Uh, Brian, when I think of countries like uh, America, Russia, Australia, China, India, these are very, very big countries, Canada, with huge tracts of land where, by and large, there are no people living. If you go to the American West, for example, a lot of Irish people think of the states being, you know, cities and California. Actually, most of America is kind of empty. Okay. Um, and I can really see the proposition for a service like Starlink in a lot of those places. I'm wondering in Ireland, though, what its ultimate, where it will fall in, in the end. Because if we presumably see this national broadband plan out, uh, and you marry that with the networks uh, from the likes of Air and Cyro, including to BlackRock, I'm sure within a while you'll have your fiber to your your home uh, solution there. I'm wondering what you know what the ultimate uh, market addressable market in a country like Ireland is for Starlink. Well, in the context of um, Starlink, um, Musk has said that not only does Starlink aim at rural areas, but it also aims at semi-rural areas. You know, it's not suitable for congested areas, urban areas at all, because of the. But, but when he when he says that, does he not? Is he not inferring semi-urban areas that don't have decent or proper broadband? Well, 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 look at where he's operating or planning to operate in Europe: Austria, Netherlands, uh, France, Germany, in the UK, the North of Ireland. Um, so it is very suitable for rural areas, provided they uh, there isn't too big a concentration of users. So yeah. obviously Australia and so forth, where it's also in the process of operating, are big, big areas. But yeah. as you wrote an article about two months ago about the idea of extending the national broadband plan to mm. the 100,000 uh, homes that have access only to lousy broadband at the moment. That's right. That's going to be a problem, I think. They're all candidates for Starlink. Yep. So Starlink need not be confined to rural areas, remote cottages, etc. The other, the other thing is, uh, as Starlink develops, it's going to get into backhaul. And this will open up a lot more opportunities. So I don't know how big the market in Ireland is, uh, but it could be potentially a bit more significant than, than we might think, because in a year or two, the cost of the antenna is going to have come down from the $500 or euro to about €300. Euro. Yeah. And yeah, the, 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 it still is a really significant challenge, though. If you are in an area that gets... Let's say you, you're getting 100 megabits per second. Let's say, for example, you're connected to this fiber in your area. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to understand how somebody will pay two to three times as much per month for a service that will give them half or a third uh, of the speed. Sure, the address look at the situation now in Ireland. We have COVID. 
extensive working from home, which was not in the, in, in the plan at all. And we're looking at a five, six year uh, program for the National Broadband Plan. And that's, re that's really the address of the market, is that? To, yeah. We have hundreds of thousands of new homes will not get broadband for three or four years. Now, what I believe is that... Oh, we, where are these new homes, by the way? That's, that's another argument for another podcast, but go on. But I would be arguing that the government should even look at subsidising the cost of the antenna, as they're doing in Germany. For 200,000 homes in Germany, they're going to pay, give out vouchers for the antenna. Now, that could be done also in Ireland. The numbers would obviously be much lower because the broadband scheme is only for by 40,000 homes. Mm -hmm. But there's potentially 100,000 homes that uh, will be left till the very end, you know, the mid-20s before they get broadband. Well, there's there's no question uh, about that. I mean, if you look at the rollout to date, it's been delayed because of COVID. There are a couple of thousand or maybe even just a couple of hundred that are actually connected mm -hmm. um, so far. And even so, so you've got this problem of at least two to three hundred thousand homes that for at least two years, maybe more, won't have access to what you and I would call decent broadband so that's one market because I, if i have to pay over the odds for two years i probably will pay it because i, I i'm just I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice what is an essential modern utility for two years to save you know 600 euro but adrian look at the national economics um, to give broadband antenna to to uh, 10,000 home or 20,000 homes at 500 euro a skull it's only going to cost 10 and if you yeah. stack that up against the cost of broadband, which to pass a home is probably costing six or seven thousand. It is, but although if you're suggesting that uh, subsidizing a Starlink voucher uh, in place of uh, one of the five forty thousand homes that are going to wait for two or three uh, two or three years, the the economics of that you'd be breaking the contract there i think because you'd be creating a risk as small as it is that the home that gets the uh, the starlink service uh, may not then be available for the fiber to the home service or may oh, choose not uh, not to have it, it, it it's a it's it's a, it's a can of worms state mm. the whole area but we're not just talking about two or three years wait we're talking about a five or six year wait and if you've young children at school or and working from home or setting up a mini business, the cost of Starlink is tiny compared with. Yeah, this, I mean this, that's a, that's a point well taken. Yeah, this Sorry, is one thing. Right. One thing is very very. Um, you know when you're when you're talking about the business model and the the Irish part of that. Yeah, the difficulty here is that we are such a tiny country. Um, you know our, our entire country is the size of maybe Greater Manchester or not even that, probably Swindon. Now, when you look at that from a global scale, we we really make very little difference. We have a very small number of customers potentially for SpaceX, where the really, really big game changer here is that if you look at the potential to have a 100 meg pipe or a 200 meg pipe into Africa or India or rural Calcutta, where you can get a staff member to work for you for a way less than you can work in the West, this whole new global online economy changes fundamentally and and it puts a lot of pressure on the soft skill selling uh, because you know somebody if they can learn online over there they can then sell their product and service online and they can operate as if they were sitting in dublin whereas mm -hmm. we've had a huge technical advantage with our infrastructure over the last couple of years that's a lot of that is going to disappear and and of course that scares the bejesus out of a lot of policymakers yeah, yeah, here yeah. as well that 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 won't be a frictionless transition yeah. if and when it happens you saw the reaction for example when facebook uh three weeks ago announced that a small proportion of their workers in dublin would be allowed to work from abroad something that it multinationals here traditionally do okay. not allow mm -hmm. for you know regulatory reasons tax reasons for uh, FDI reasons with the IDA with agreements that they, they've struck there and there was you know panicked is this the end of the Dublin tech scene etc so um, I'd suggest that w what you're, you're talking about is logical but I'm not sure that if we saw a big transition 
uh, to that kind of uh, working, uh, outsourced working uh, model, that there wouldn't be some sort of counter reaction, uh, in, particularly in Europe. But there's another way of looking at it. You could have people in the west of Ireland in a lovely cottage somewhere working for an American multinational because they have access to good high speed broadband. It, it, and, that, and that's happening. Do you know the funny thing about yeah, yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. is that is that for, for that kind of model, mm -hmm. for that exact particular type of model, you don't actually need 200 megabits per second. Now, no. Don't get me wrong. I, I have a pain in my neck <laughs> with people coming at me and saying, oh, do, do, you know, for God's sake, the whole national broadband plan, all of the, it's all a waste of money. You don't need more than 20 megabits. That's absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. you, you, you like in the, in the, sh in the short to medium term, you will absolutely need more than 20 mega, megabits per second. Having said that, if you're working for, I know of somebody, for example, who was told by her employer indeed in Dublin, the jobs site, that uh, they can work from home forever. So she left the Dublin department she's renting, she moved home to Waterford, and she has bought a place in Waterford. Now she works from there and the broadband is fine. I think she's on phone line broadband. I think she gets about what you get, Brian, 80 to 100 megabits per second, but that's actually okay for that, uh, for now. Well, remember that the FCC is only requiring 100 megs per second by 2025. And so mm. is a, is is a it, the EU is, it, is looking at that as I well. Start, yeah. When I started with the internet, I was on CompuServe, which was about about a hundred um, kilobytes a second. Kilobit, yeah. So in the last 20, 25 years, we've only moved uh, say fifty up to fifty megabits per second yeah. because there have been so many advances in terms of compression of signals and that have made the issue of uh, maybe speed less so because I remember <laughs> looking at video and said it would never go on to the internet. Yeah, well, uh, latency still is a big issue. I mean, I know even in my own line of work, for example, if I'm doing interviews uh, from home uh, on the web uh, with TV stations, for example, mm -hmm. the delay is actually a crucial thing. It's actually important. Even on the phone, it can yeah. actually... Uh, be important well, thing. I'm using I'm using Starlink at the moment on on um, at the moment, and uh, typically um, I've taken about 400 readings now on the use of the system. Mm. And my my latency is about 46 milliseconds. Um, 30, 30, 32 to 35 is normal at the moment on the Starlink. Mm. Just one okay. thing, one thing on Starlink, just to deal with the. The, the latency issue and, and, and the performance at the moment is that the uh, Barry system and the system that we've been testing as well, they're, they're beta test systems and they don't have a license yet in Ireland to sell. But they're mad keen to sell and they're trying to get a license to actually sell. At the minute they have, they'll be going to market and selling straight away. Now, what we've noticed is that the network at the moment is, is 1,600 or thereabout. Um, it's, it's not fully a fleshed out network just yet that but they're they're racing out very very quickly we see the odd pocket breakouts so we've had situations where um on voip uh, sorry on zoom calls and on teams calls in an hour's call you might have maybe a couple of seconds 10 to 15 seconds or 20 seconds of dropout but that that's about the extent of it um, and that's just where there's pockets where there wouldn't be a satellite over you at that point in time um, by the end of this year, I would expect there to be no pockets left. Um, it seems that way. I, I recorded um, dropouts for 720 hours of Starlink use, and the average uh, dropout was about 0.2%. Mm, it's low. Mm. That was mainly related to two significant dropouts of 10 minutes each. Which um, were due to no satellites. I think they were changing the system. But at the moment, for the past month, my dropout rate has been five seconds a day. And Brian, mm -hmm. uh, ordinary people listen to this who don't know much about technology. They would ask questions such as, "Does the weather make a difference?" Um, we don't know. I don't know. I've been looking for that because uh, we've had very, very few rainy days. Um, and so I've been unable to form a view. Now, rain fate could be an issue, but 
Um, it's right, it does on, slow down things in some instances, but it's not clear. Looking at Reddit now and, and looking at worldwide experiences, um, it's a, snowstorms are unlikely to disturb the system. Hailstones, big hailstones will disturb the system. Mm. And heavy rain may disturb the system, but it depends on what the rain is. Is it at the user end or is it at the ground station end? Uh, it's something I don't know, but there would obviously be some rain fade in very extreme conditions. It's not It's not normally an issue just on the rain fade. Um, when we started first and we switched on the KA systems, which are sensitive to rain fade, um, Ireland was expected to be a, site, a, a location with problems on rain fit because of the amount of rain in Ireland. We found actually across Europe where the bigger problem was for rain fit was Germany. And the reason why is that Irish rain tends to be small droplets and it tends to come in a kind of a grey mist for six months. Whereas in Germany, they tend to have more thunder um, uh, thundercloud drops. And the bigger droplets and the heavier density of the rain causes a higher level of rain fade. So Ireland actually is not a, a rain fade country as such. It, although that does suggest that any kind of climate change could change the way that your starling dish uh, performs, for example, if the rain gets heavier, for example. Not as much with the Leos. It's more of a geo problem. Um, just the, the geo satellites are so much further out and the, the signal is that bit weaker, it, it's more of an issue for the, the, the geos than LEOs, the low-orbit satellites, sorry, for ge geosynchronous satellites versus low-orbit satellites. You know, you know the climate change will also affect uh, telegraph poles and uh, ducks, flood ducks, etc. So it's, a, it's an issue that everybody has to face in so many ways. It, it, it's true, although the one, if you talk to any of the, senior executives in telecoms companies, one of the reasons they're so gung-ho on fiber as opposed to copper is it's so much more bulletproof. I mean, it's so much better in weather than crap copper lines uh, in terms of the damage and the outages and the uh, you know the gaps that people experience every year. Listen, guys, we have to leave it there. I appreciate you both coming on to uh, talk to me about that. There's Rory Fitzpatrick, CEO of the National Space Center, and Brian Flanagan, who is a retired consultant and a Starlink tester outer at the moment, maybe a customer in future. But for me, Adrian Weckler, uh, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunday Independent, that's all we have time for this week. So thank you again for tuning in and we'll be here same time next week. Bye-bye.